Good afternoon, students, members of the faculty, visitors to our campus. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Michael Trick, and I'm the dean here at Carnegie Mellon University in Qatar. And it is my pleasure to welcome you here today. Uh, our speaker today is Srinivasan uh, uh, Seshan. Seshan, geez, just after I ask you and then I mispronounce it. <laughs> Head of computer <laughs> at Carnegie Mellon University's uh, Computer Science Department and the Joseph F. Traub Professor of Computer Science. Dr. Uh, Seshan uh, received his PhD in 1995 from the University of California, Berkeley, and then worked as a research staff member at IBM's TJ Watson Research Center. Uh, in 2000, uh, Dr. Seishin uh, joined the faculty at Carnegie Mellon University, becoming a full, full professor in 2011. Dr. Seishin's primary interests are in the areas of network protocols, mobile computing, and distributed network applications. His current work explores the challenges and opportunities related to new networking uh, architectures, network security, and internet fairness. Uh, Dr. Seishin has received many honors for his work, including the three-year Finn uh, Mechanica Career Development Professorship in Computer Science, two IBM Faculty Partnership Awards, and the National Science Foundation's Career Award. Uh, before I invite our guests to the podium, I would like to note that today's talk is part of our Distinguished Lecture Series here at CMUQ. Distinguished Lectures provide a glimpse into the depth and breadth of the scholarship of many of the experts who visit our campus. This distinguished lecture is named in honor of A. Nico Haberman, who was the head of computer science department at CMU from 1980 to 88, and was then the founding dean of the School of Computer Science. Please welcome, join me in welcoming uh, Srinivasan Seishan to CMU. It is working, great. So today I'm gonna to give a talk titled uh, The Past, Present, and Future of Delivering Multimedia on the Internet. And I'm gonna to try to explain how the internet and multimedia delivery have gone hand in hand for several decades and how it's really driving the future of the internet. But first, just to keep this a little bit interactive, I wanted to ask a trivia question. What was the first mu music video shown on MTV? Um, one hint, it was in the 1981, do I have an answer? No. Who said that? Whoa, <laughs> that was it. I didn't really expect anyone to get it, but congratulations. It was indeed the Buggles video killed the radio star. And what was really you know, cute about it being the first uh, video on MTV was it heralded the, the move of entertainment from what we were using for broadcast television, you know, we were, had those antennas and those you know, televisions at the time, to cable TV and a new medium for delivery of video and content to the end users in their homes. This talk, on the other hand, is going to be talking about how we're now gone through a transition of you know, delivering video and content to the users through cable TV, to how the internet has become the primary mechanism by which we deliver video content to end users, and how the internet itself has been changed by that entire process. So given that this is the, the theme of the talk, I wanted to break it down a little bit and look at what I'm really gonna be talking about because this can be interpreted in a number of different ways. So first, what do I mean by multimedia content today? Well, these are all the applications that we use, the Netflix, the Skypes, the, the Flash video, YouTube, Napster, the ones that we use today, as well as the ones that have you know, gone by the wayside like Napster and Real Video. So we're gonna look at the history of all these types of applications and how they've used the internet and how they work. Now, why is this really important? You may say, oh, the internet's actually built for a wide range of uses and applications, why do I care about video in particular? So this is a graph from the Cisco you know, annual forecast about network traffic. The interesting thing to note here, see if this works, um, is you can look at these percentages or the bars over here. The bottom two bars, the blue and the green, are video. 
very explicitly. There are roughly about 75 to 80 percent, depending on the year you look at, of all bytes transferred on the internet backbones. And to be honest, if you look a little bit further and you say, oh, what about this other stuff, the file sharing and the web data? Well, most likely those are probably video as well. Those people sharing you know, DVDs or Blu-ray discs and the, the websites that are streaming you video in some fashion. So what we have today is a network that is transferring about 90% of its data is video in some format or another. And the internet is fundamentally a video transfer network with a little bit of other stuff thrown in. So this brings me to the next part of the, 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 the goal of the talk, which is the internet. Now the internet means a lot of different things to different people. As someone who's been working on network protocols his entire life, it has a particular meaning. And that particular meaning happens to be the focus of the talk, so I need to share that with you. The internet is based on many different technologies built one on top of another. So when we buy a laptop or we buy a cell phone, we think about the link technologies. Oh, does it have 5G? Does it have Wi-Fi? Does it have Bluetooth? That's really kind of the one link hop technology that connects us to something else. And on top of that, we have protocols that connect us to the rest of the world. So there's the internet protocol that helps connect together the routers of the internet. There's things like the TCP and UDP that you often hear about that connect you know, endpoints to each other. And then finally, there are all these application layer protocols like HTTP and uh, SMTP and others that connect together the web, your email, and other applications. So these are what are called the layers of the internet protocol stack. Now, one interesting thing to note about this is that in the bottom of this, we have lots of different choices. You can say, oh, do I want a device with Wi-Fi? Do I want a device with Bluetooth? Or do I want a device with something else? But once you go up to the middle portion of the stack, all the choices go away. This is, IP is like the Esperanto of the internet. Everyone has to talk IP in order to talk to each other. It's really what defines the internet at its core. If you go one layer up further still, you go up to these, you know, TCP and UDP, there's actually a very limited set of choices there as well. But then once you get to applications, there's an explosion of applications. There's, you know, you can use Skype, you can use the web, or you can use mail, or you can use, you know, file transfer protocol applications. There's a wide range of applications at the top. As a result, one of the things that people say is that the internet has an hourglass-like architecture, where there's only a narrow set of things in the middle but many choices at the top and the bottom. What we're gonna be talking about today is that core narrow waste. And that's really what defines the internet to the people who work on internet protocols and infrastructure. This is the IP and the TCP and UDP. And you know, when you talk to a protocol person, they'll give you this picture, but another way to sort of think about it is that there's also a lot of sort of secret hidden infrastructure that we deploy as part of the internet, the way that we convert names from something like www.google.com to an IP address that you use to actually connect to it. There's other sort of infrastructure to actually deliver the content as well to you. And these are, you know, you know using a general kind of, you know, you know, you know high-level view, they're really core in internet infrastructure today. And we would not be able to use the internet and the way we use it today without this infrastructure. And the last part of this statement is about changes and attempted changes. Now, you may say the internet changes all the time. One of the you know, terms that we've coined over the you know, many past years is, oh, in internet time, you know, three months is like five years. We would say the internet is changing so rapidly, you would go away for a few months, you come back, all the applications, anything else, all the buzzwords have changed. So why is it important that we're looking at the changes? Aren't there so many of them? Well, the changes of the community that we typically see in the glossy press are focused on this top where there are many applications and at the bottom where there's many new technologies. What is actually stunning about the internet is that you can probably take a computer probably from the mid 80s connected to the internet because the middle part, this purple and green part, 
have largely remained unchanged over all these years. And as a result, any changes that you see in these kind of red sections, between these red sections, is incredibly impactful and earth shattering in terms of the internet development. So that's the focus of the talk. And the, and the structure of the talk I'm gonna to give today is kind of a path through history. We're gonna look back at how the internet looked back at kind of the dawn of the modern internet back in the, in the 1990s and look through where we are today and then take a glimpse into the next decade and what might happen there. So let's go, you know, sit back in our way back machine and see where we are back in the 80s. At the end of the 80s and the early 90s. So this is a graph of internet traffic back from the late 80s to the early 90s. Okay. This is back when the internet used to run on one network. Now when you, you know, look at the internet, it runs on the AT&T backbone, and it runs on the Sprint backbone, and all these different you know, providers provide us connectivity and create what the internet is. Back then, the internet was run by the NSF, and it was, that was it. You, if you wanted connectivity, you talked to the NSF and you would get connectivity. So what we have here is a breakdown of different applications ranging from FTP, for those of you who remember FTP, so based, file exchange was basically logging into another machine and grabbing a file using a program called FTP. Email, login, remote login. Name lookup is uh, th that thing I talked about where you convert something from a human readable name like google.com into a, an IP address. And other, other TCP UDP services, we'll get to that in a second. But from the creation of the internet to about this point in time, the traffic mix probably looked exactly like this. Some combination of people basically logging into you know, supercomputers or, or large mainframes somewhere else, you know, people trying to transfer you know, experimental results. This was an educational network with the primary use being able, the ability to access remote computational resources in some way. And so what do we see as the killer apps? You know, roughly 20% on each of these categories. Now the yellow category is kind of interesting. So anyone know what happened in the internet about 93, 94? The web, this was the dawn of the web. So this was a very exciting time for the internet at large. So NCSA Mosaic, which was the original web browser, came out in mid 93. Uh, Netscape Navigator came out in mid-94. Uh, another sort of interesting sort of tidbit and that's very appropriate for today's talk is that the internet moved from you know, being a, uh, an academic endeavor to a commercial network. And the person that was in charge at the time at the NSF was, any guesses? Nico Haberman. So he was the director of the size uh, um, portion, the computer science portion of the NSF director. He was actually, the thing I read yesterday was that he was the one that was called to Congress to testify about converting the internet from being uh, academic to commercial. So this is, like I said, this is the last snapshot of what the academic internet looked like. The yellow part that I was getting to here this is basically the start of the web. So between systems like, there were predecessor systems like Gopher, Waze, the World Wide Web started, you know, like I said, in mid 93. Basically it was something that the author was like, oh, this is other stuff that's getting popular. <laughs> so it's an interesting kind of, you know, viewpoint. So now what we're looking towards, you know, beyond this, it's what drove the internet past this point. And how has the internet start, you know, started from this role where it was kind of these generic kind of simple applications to what we use today. So what was the vision? So this is a picture of what the, one of the you know, visions of video on the internet in 92 was. So people thought a great thing to be able to bring to the internet 
would be this ability to do multi-user video conferencing, being able to transmit video across the network and be able to receive it on any desktop machine in some way. An interesting sort of point in space, you know, is the first large scale video delivery on the internet was a Rolling Stones concert that was sent across what was then called the multicast backbone. And this was done in 1994. People had already started doing broadcast television, so Congress, ses congressional sessions, as well as NASA space launches were broadcast across this type of technology. So one other sort of fun trivia bit. So this is, uh, I was digging for sort of screenshots of these old tools. Um, of course, the one that I get as one of the first Google results happens to be my office in grad school. So, so one of the things I worked on was actually some of the technology related to this and bringing it to wireless systems. So given that this was a vision that they were working towards this, why was it so hard to get to work on the internet? Well, the problem is, is the, the foundation on which the internet was built and the design philosophy behind the internet. And to understand why there was such a disconnect between delivering video on the internet and doing those old type of applications, we actually have to understand what's the difference between these file transfer applications, these remote logins, and what is video transfer and how does it work? So one interesting thing about, you know, people are probably familiar with bandwidth now, so I don't have to explain it in too great a detail. You know, you, you always complain, oh, I don't have enough bandwidth, these downloads are going slow. So whenever you transfer a file across the network, the rate at which it comes to you is the bandwidth. And if it goes faster, you're typically a little bit happier. And so all this graph is showing here is your happiness on the y-axis versus the bandwidth you're getting. And so when the bandwidth is low, you're not really happy. But as it gets better and better, you get more happy. But doubling the band or increasing the bandwidth by one megabit, you know, it makes a big difference when you're going from one to two. When you're going from 101 to 102, it doesn't make quite the same difference. So it has this concave shape to this graph. Now, the same cannot be said for video, especially the way they were, they were doing video in that previous picture. So the problem with video is that you can send bandwidth, you can use it to transfer some video, but usually what ends up happening is that you encoded this video in some fashion where it says, oh, look, I took 30 frames per second. I did you know, HD resolution. And that defines the bandwidth you need in order to deliver that video. And the problem is that if you don't have that much bandwidth, in order to display the video, it suddenly has to either slow it down, make it all choppy, or you miss out on bits and parts of it. And so the end result is that if you have less than the bandwidth you need, i.e. on this side of the curve, Basically, you're miserable. It looks terrible. It's completely unusable. But once you get above that threshold, all you have your video, and you don't really care how much better it can get. And so that's kind of the key thing. Now, the internet was designed for applications like this and not for applications like this. And we'll see why in a little bit. The two key things that we need to realize for video is that in order for video to work well, you need a guarantee that you'll get more than this amount of bandwidth, that cutoff point. If you get less than that amount of bandwidth, you're up a creek. On the other hand, for file transfer, any bandwidth you give me is fine. I'll just be happier the more you give me. And in both cases, you should also realize that if you're on the far right side of the curve, things work out OK. It just turns out that in video, compared to what you could get on the internet back in 92, getting to the right side was really hard. Right? The amount of bandwidth we needed for like even that posted stamp video was a lot compared to what you would typically get on the internet. So we had to tackle these two issues. How do we get to go about getting guarantees on the internet? And how do we get better bandwidth and efficiency? So this is an interesting list. This comes out of a paper called The Design Philosophy of the DARPA Internet. Whenever people build a system, they have to have a set of objectives in mind. And these objectives help them decide what trade-offs to make at any given point in time. 
oh, should I try to make this go you know, faster or should I make it go higher, right? So which one's more important for me in some way? The internet is no different than any other system. You have a set of trade-offs and that we have built into the system design. And this particular paper that I mentioned here basically articulated the set of trade-offs that people were making in designing the internet back in the 70s. And the things were, you know, oh, our goal is to basically connect together networks. That's what we're trying to do. That's what the internet is by its very nature. Two, we want to make the internet survivable. You know, in case any part of the network breaks, oh, the rest of the network should keep going on. That's actually where we get the traditional quote of, the internet was designed to survive nuclear war, right? This notion of a network that was, you can break up any bits and pieces of it, but it should still work the parts that remain. And so this is an interesting list, and I'm not gonna go through all of the different points, but it's an ordered list. The stuff at the top is more important than the stuff at the bottom, and that's the important thing to take away. And if we look at this list a little bit closer, specifically this notion of I want the pieces of the network to survive, I want to support all sorts of different services, and all, you know, people still don't know how to build networks yet, they're gonna build all sorts of stuff. I wanted to work with any of them. The end result of those three things that are very high up on the list was really the core of the internet today, which is a network where we take the core of the network and we make it incredibly dumb. And the routers and the switches of the internet are actually incredibly simple in what they do and how they process messages. This is actually an incredible insight in that all previous networks had ended up being much more you know, intelligent about how they process packets, what type of work they did inside the network. But this network said, I'm not gonna do anything inside the network. And that's part of the reason why the internet has done so well is because it's been able to scale, go faster, and be cheap as a result. And how it won over many other networks. But there's a implication of this particular conclusion. And that is that because I'm gonna make everything really simple, and I'm not gonna make any assumptions about what's going on inside the network, making no assumptions means I can't provide any guarantees either. The, you know, each of the networks we interconnect, they're gonna do whatever they want. I'm not gonna make any assumptions, I'm just gonna send packets. And this was kind of a linked together causal relationship. So this is actually built into the design philosophy of the actual internet. So going back to the previous requirement of, oh, we want video, oh, well, to get video, I need a guaranteed bandwidth. It was a total mismatch. So what did people in the 90s do? They said, okay, let's revisit all of this. Maybe the internet design was not quite right. Let's add a bunch of intelligence into the network in some ways. And what they did was they said, we want to provide these strong guarantees. If you want 10 megabits between New York and Chicago, I can give you 10 megabits guaranteed between New York and Chicago. But in order to do that, you need to make sure that the internet is a shared resource. So if someone else takes up 20 megabits and you don't have 10 megabits left over, I have to figure out what everyone else wants and I need to make sure that person you know, X does not impact person Y's performance anymore. If they're trying to transfer a big file, it shouldn't make my file go slower or my video transfer go slower. So this implied that we had to do this notion of isolation. We need to isolate users from each other so they didn't impact each other's performance. We also had to keep track of what each person wanted. Oh, Srini wanted 10 megabits per second. Oh, I, should, I need to keep track of that. And I need to remember which transfer he wanted 10 megabits per second for. Finally, I needed a way for my applications to say, oh, Srini's watching YouTube right now. YouTube is requesting 10 megabits per second from the network and make sure that it's allocated to me. So we, basically what ended up happening was we just, the, the community designed what was called the integrated service architecture. It took all of these things and came up with clever solutions to say, you can provide guarantees on the internet in terms of performance, and lo and behold, for the efficiency part, 
The key challenge was we wanted to support TV broadcasts. So going back to the Rolling Stone concert, the goal was to say, look, I can have the Rolling Stones play in Dallas, and I can deliver it to thousands of people all around the world. The problem with this is that I have to send all these copies all from the source of the data. And so this is really making the network really crowded, especially near the source, as I send thousands and thousands of copies of the exact same data across the network. So what did they do? They said, we're going to come up with a different way to deliver this data. We're going to have it go out, and then we're going to have every router in the network try to figure out and duplicate the messages inside the network so there's only one copy sent from the source and built up over time. So this was an incredibly efficient way to deliver the data, but it would require you to keep track of who wants this data, where they're located, what the network looks like in some way. So it added a lot of complexity to the routers in the network as well. So what happened to these things? So do we, you know, how many people actually in this, in this hall, you know, have ever used IP multicast or IP integrated service? One, <laughs> two, I guess, including me. <laughs> so, uh, so the thing is that these things never got deployed. Um, or they got deployed, but never that widely outside of a small group of academics that were interested in it. And the fundamental issue was that they were relatively complex. And you know, I could probably go through a laundry list of issues. And if you ask any two people in networking, they would give you a different laundry list of issues. And that was really the death knell of these protocol designs. Now, in many ways, the entire story of video and, and the internet in this, in this particular case can almost be written like a story. This was kind of the fall of the hero, right? The internet research community over the 1980s and the 70s had created the modern equivalent of the Great Pyramids, right? We had, as a community, built the internet and everyone was using it. It was a, you know, like the, the success story of the research community at large, that we would have impact, we would change the economy, we would change the way people communicate, you know, and eventually change the way people even socialize. But, and if you think about the mindset of this community at the dawn of the 90s, we could do no wrong. Everything we had built would go into the infrastructure. We had proposed some protocol X, we would figure it out, it would go in, and it would get deployed. And suddenly, the 1990s were, a, you know, you, you, we had all these great ideas. You know, so, for example, I mentioned things like multicast integrated service. The other thing that was developed in the 90s was IPv6, right? How many people use IPv6? Yeah, maybe a couple more. So a little bit more popular than these two. So these were the three great failures of the 90s in terms of the, the networking community. We were like, oh, these are going to change the way the internet works. This is going to fix all the key problems. It's going to enable a new generation of applications. Nobody wanted them. Right? The internet had changed in this meantime. It had become a commercial endeavor. It had become incredibly popular. Deploying new things were difficult. And so this was, like I said, this was a moment of soul searching for the community. And what it's doing you know, quietly underneath is it's saying, oh, I'm using up too much bandwidth. It's too high quality. Let me pick a lower quality because your house does not have enough bandwidth. And so it's switching all the time as well. But these switches can be glaring in some fashion. So these are actually, if you look at an underlying system today, it's doing all of these optimizations across all of these different sort of parameters in some joint way. And it's actually quite a complex system. And the key thing is not everyone in every video is exactly the same. So if you think about Netflix, so I don't know about other people's viewing behavior for Netflix, but mine is, okay, I have 45 minutes now. You know, I'm going to watch a show. You, know, you sit down and you want the show to come in, and you want it to come in smoothly. But if it takes one second to start up versus 15 seconds to start up, 
doesn't matter. You've set aside 45 minutes probably to watch whatever Game of Thrones new episode. So, well, as a result, what they're looking for is they could have longer startup delays, but they want stable, high quality video, and you can pick all your parameters in the right way to go for that. On the other hand, if I have like three minutes of time, and I wanna do something just fun on the internet, I'll go to YouTube. I'll skim through a bunch of videos all of us quickly, and I'll find some funny one, and then I'll watch it, right? They want incredibly short videos, rapid browsing. They want to make sure you click a button, it plays right away, right? It's okay if there's a little pause in the, in the middle. The whole thing only lasts three seconds anyway, and you're gonna rewind it if there was a pause. So these things have very different objectives. And what about things like FIFA soccer? Well, here, the trade-offs are different yet because, to be honest, nobody wants to watch the game the next day, right? Everyone wants to watch it so they can chat maybe online with their friends or they're watching it with their friends or, you know, you want to see the scores live and you want to see the game live often. And so here, what ends up happening is people basically use the overlay multicast techniques I described earlier merged with the CDN infrastructure of all the thousands of servers that deployed across the network. But they still do these types of optimizations as well underneath. But this is a nice sort of scheme now. I can fine tune to the particular video application how this infrastructure works as a whole. And this is an enormous infrastructure that's been deployed by several different types of companies. That brings us to the 2010s and you know, basically now we're at the stage of fine tuning the applications and the video delivery. We have the infrastructure, the protocols in place to make this all work. So what next? You know, I joked yesterday that I'm probably a little bit foolish and I'm predicting what's next in the next 10 years. If I were a smart speaker, what I would do is I would pick something 40 years from now because then you could never check on whether the prediction is right. <laughs> But I'm gonna go ahead and be aggressive. I'm gonna predict what all happened in the next decade and we'll see how things pan out. Okay. So I see three new types of video that are really taking off that I think will change the way we do video on the internet. The first is social live streaming. This is things like Facebook Live, Periscope, Twitch, YouTube Live. Um, the second is cloud gaming and VR and 360 video. And the last is surveillance. And I'll go through each of these in turn and explain what I mean by each. Okay, so I don't know how many people use things like Facebook Live or YouTube Live. Here, there, a few. Okay, so I'll explain what it does roughly. So let's say Alice is attending the cool Rolling Stones concert today, right? It's a different experience than it was in 1994, um, but she's happy, she's enjoying her time there. Bob sitting at home, not quite, you know, didn't get those tickets, couldn't go as a result. So what ends up happening? Well, his friend Alice is happy to, you know, you know, take out her phone, basically stream live and say, oh, I'll put this on Facebook Live so my closest friends can watch as well. And now Bob is happy because he can watch the, the concert as well. Now, Charlie, who perhaps is attending the talk instead, which is not quite as exciting as a concert, uh, doesn't get to watch live streaming either, like Bob. So what does Charlie do? Well, Charlie goes home eventually and goes to Facebook Live. And of course, this is now archivally stored on Facebook as well, the whole stream. And so he can simply go back to the concert and watch it. But the interesting thing here and the sad thing here is that what Facebook does is it simply stores whatever was transmitted at the time Alice was there, right? And what people may have ever, you know, who use things like Facebook Live may have noticed is, oh, sometimes the uh, you know, cellular coverage drops out or the Wi-Fi gets slow because there's 50,000 other people at a concert doing the same thing as you. And you'll see dropouts in the video. Well, when Charlie goes back you know, next week, those dropouts are still there. 
even though it's much later. You could have gotten a recording and it would have been higher fidelity. So this is, hmm, don't know why the red box is. Okay, so this notion of traditional streaming, I'll ignore the red box for now, is in between this notion of what is typically called video on demand, things like Netflix, and things like Skype, which is video conferencing. So it's neither here nor there. Our infrastructure has been built for either video conferencing, things that are live, or things that are stored forever. And our protocols are designed for those things as well. What we want is something that has the, the, the properties of both. A little bit of live, a little bit of archival, and make those optimizations that work for both instead of just for one. Aha, huh, now it shows up. I don't know what, okay. So we need new strategies for both how you transmit data, how you store video content, and how do you buffer and, and, and use this infrastructure. Okay. So next application, uh, games, VR, and 360 video. So uh, Stadia, who knows what Stadia is? A few people. So Stadia is Google's new cloud gaming platform. Uh, I'll describe how it works in the, in the next slide. This came out last week, okay? So that was the public release of Stadia. Um, and so this, I think, is gonna change the way games are, are work on the internet today. But if you look at even things like VR and 360 video, they share a lot of similar properties as well. The challenge here is that these are all incredibly low latency interactive systems. Even when we talk about things like Skype, it turns out Skype can have a pretty high latency and still be completely usable on the orders of you know, a few hundred milliseconds. But if you look at multiplayer games or VR, you know, in the case of multiplayer games, you want about 20 to 30 milliseconds of latency at most. Otherwise, you could have more latency, but then you're probably gonna be losing, which is not that fun. <laughs> Um, for VR, it actually turns out you need even lower latencies because there's a very sort of seasickness type effect if you move your head and the picture doesn't move along with you. Similarly, the bandwidth requirements for these applications are incredibly high. If you look at things like Stadia, we're looking at about 35 megabits per second from Google to your you know, home in order to do reasonable gaming. Um, if you look at things like VR headsets, the the place that gets renders the video to your headset, we're talking about hundreds of megabits in order to do uncompressed video. Okay, high level description of how uh, video games work in, in both the, the traditional way as well as VR. So here we have a game controller, a game console, TV, and some game servers. So the basic idea here is that when you make moves with your game controller, it's connected by a wire or by a direct wireless link to your game console. At the same time, it's getting updates from the game servers about what is the world state in this game that it wants to render. And at this point, what ends up happening is that it renders an image for you and displays it on your screen, connected by probably an HDMI cable. Okay. So the end result is that there's a very low latency between interactions from the user out to what gets displayed on the screen. And so you can hide all these other latencies pretty easily, and you can move around the game world very rapidly without you know, it being very choppy in any way. What is Stadia doing? So Stadia says, look, I have a game controller. It's actually a Wi-Fi game controller. It sends messages to Stadia. When you move the joystick, it sends a movement update to Stadia. So these are the Google Cloud servers, wherever the Google data center might be. Stadia, on the other hand, is getting updates from now the game servers that are running the game world. And what it generates is standard video. Right? So now we've taken what was traditionally an update, a, 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 an application where you were getting small updates we've converted it into a video streaming application, okay? So it sends it to your Chromecast little dongle, 
it gets displayed on, you, get to, you send your updates back to Blizzard so they can update their thing. But in the end, you update your screen. So now this green hop here is part of your critical path in terms of end-to-end -end latency, interaction, everything else. Okay. Why is this useful though? It's useful because now I don't have to own a, you know, a game console. I can do all sorts of clever things. Um, you know, it has all the benefits of the cloud that we all, you know, we all love. Now, I mentioned some of the, oops, uh, wrong direction. So I mentioned some of these requirements for these applications. I want to go into why are they hard to achieve on the internet today? And the hardest one is actually latency. We can buy more bandwidth, but you can't buy latency very easily. And you may say 30 milliseconds, that's enormous, right? You may say, oh, wait a second, you look at the size of the US, you know, it's you know, about 6,000 kilometers or 5,000 kilometers across. You take speed of light in a fiber, and it's about 25 milliseconds. So you should be able to send a message to the other end of the US in 25 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds for a round trip. Okay, so you can't quite play a game across the country, but if you put it in the same state or a country the size of Qatar, it should be trivial. But the problem is, so this is a graph of the relative latency for, for different operations on the internet relative to the speed of light. Okay. And so the key thing to notice is largely the scale over here and the median points. Okay. And so it turns out that to do anything on the internet today, you cannot do it at the speed of light. You may wish I could get a ping time of you know, you know, 50 milliseconds across country. You won't get it in practice. And the problem is, is that the protocols that we've designed inherently all do all sorts of handshakes. So that's one problem. If there's anything where messages are lost and you need to recover them, recovering from messages takes a long time. Oh, this message was lost or this frame was dropped in your video. Do I need to retransmit? That takes seconds. Finally, even if you look at the underlying behavior, going back to the, 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 the design of the internet, the way we actually discover capacity is limited. And just to explain that why, I'm just gonna look at that one thing and go back to this design philosophy. It, basically the idea was we have to be incredibly simple about the core of the network. The key idea on the internet is that routers are simple. They are not going to tell you how overloaded they are or how loaded they are at any given point in time. Just to show you a very quick picture of this, if you have Stadia sending you data as an endpoint, packets get queued up inside the network in what are called these queues. And eventually these queues get overflowed and that's the only way that we can learn about the capacity of the network. The end result is that internet protocols are forced to keep these queues full. And that always adds hundreds of milliseconds of latency. Okay. Cover one last quick challenge and then I'll wrap up. Um, the last one is perhaps the most significant contributor to what I think the future of video will be in terms of volume. If we look around any major city today, you'll probably find at least tens of thousands of cameras. You know, and probably the more aggressive ones like London and Beijing, you will find hundreds of thousands of cameras or millions of cameras. We've designed an infrastructure aimed at delivering video to humans. No one is gonna end up watching these million cameras and their video feeds. The type of encodings that we use, the type of delivery mechanisms that we use, the way we sort of prune down the video, where do we store it, all of these things are wrong for this type of application. And this is gonna swamp in terms of the amount of data being generated, anything else that we see out there today. So 
that's the last one I wanted to point out in terms of how do we transfer all this data. And it's not just about networking. How do we analyze all of this data? And even our fundamental optimization goals of trying to make users happy. Now I want to make machines happy. These are all different about surveillance systems and the type of data that we're going to generate. So looking towards the 2020s, what do I think is going to happen? There's a bunch of really cool, interesting new applications out there with incredibly diverse needs and demands. We're going to have to revisit all of these things, our assumptions again, and start from scratch. So what I hopefully have convinced you today is that video content delivery has been and will continue to be the driver of the core internet design in many ways. And that video applications will continue to evolve and we will have to evolve our networks to go along with them. With that, I'll take any questions. Good, thank you. We have time. So, uh, yes, there's a lot of pressure on these companies to get good performance, right? So if you look at kind of the Stadia requirements, for example, for Google, they really need to be able to drive down the latency, be able to manage their own links. Now, in terms of net neutrality, I think uh, I have, you know, probably out, you know, somewhat uh, outsider views on net neutrality. Um, I, I think it's overblown in its, uh, the perception of, you know, the problems of net neutrality and the impact. I think there are probably far simpler rules than keeping the network fully neutral in some ways. I think there is value in being able to pay for service of some forms, but you have to make sure that monopoly type constraints don't ruin it. And I think probably monopoly laws are probably more effective at that than, you know, net neutrality laws. So in general, I think it's a tough question. It, 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 the, the flattening of the internet brings, you know, nice things as well. It makes it much easier to understand performance, much easier to understand peering behavior, but there are some dangers as well. Thank the speaker again. We do have this wonderful little memento of this occasion. Oh. Uh, would you prefer, uh, can you, you, does this work here? Okay, yes. so we'll take a picture here. Good, thank you.